Right, okay, so before I get into the video, I just want to start by thanking each and every single one of you who have been following me from the year 2022 into the year 2023. So, Happy New Year! And if you are new to my channel, then hi. I'm Incorrigible Delinquent. Pleased to meet ya. As of early 2023, I'm still a growing channel, and I get a ton of advice from all my mates and experienced content creators. One strategy for growth is what they call a call to action. It basically involves asking you, the viewer, to like and subscribe my video. Now, I've only ever really done this once before, and to be honest with you, it's not really my cup of tea to ask you to like and subscribe my videos for every single one of them. So what I will say is, like and subscribe my video, only if you want to though. There's absolutely no pressure if you don't want to, and regardless if you do or you don't, I'm still going to be making content to deliver to you guys anyway. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy the video. Let's get started. I've just gotten off of this random town. Encourageable delinquent, what brings you over to the McClady? Behold La Mia, in all its glory. I've been walking through this town for a solid 20 minutes now. I'm gonna get to the Mopoli. Well guys, it was a mission. Before I start showcasing the ancient battleground site of Thermopylae, I want to briefly establish some context for those of you who do not know. Who is doing the fighting and what are they fighting for? Thermopylae starts with three major players at the time, Sparta, Athens and Persia. Let's talk about Sparta, by far the most hardcore society. If you are a male born in Sparta, then you are constantly drilled in the arts of war, destined to become an unquestioning and efficient war machine soldier. Whenever Spartans are not at war, then they are training for war. And should the male be born with any mental illness or physical handicap, then they were usually abandoned in the wilderness. Sparta, 492 BCE. The Persians initiate the first move by sending messengers to demand tribute. The tribute is a ceremony of presenting earth and water to Persia. At this time, most other Greek city-states did comply and submit. Most. Sparta didn't. No, they executed the Persian envoys by hurling them down a well. This is Sparta! As you can tell, this warrior class society is pretty resistant on the idea of Persian rule. I taught Alexander the Great, I'm the great Aristotle. I've talked about Athens democracy in my previous video, so if you want a brief on how direct democracy functions, then I recommend you watch my adventure on the Parthenon. If you're up to speed, then you know that Athens is practically the opposite of Sparta. Where Sparta is a soldier elite society, Athens is a citizenship society. All male citizens have equal rights and opportunity to participate in the democratic body of Athens, the assembly. Their society valued individualism, allowing citizens to self-determine their own destiny, paving way for many to become philosophers, artists, or the likes. And politicians guided the ship of state by persuading the populace to vote on policy matters. Athens and Sparta are bitter rivals, threatened by each other. However, both factions would ironically shelve the reservations when in the shadow of a much larger threat. With the military might of Sparta, and the navy and creativity of Athens combined. A coalition was born to resist the Persian juggernaut. I thought I'd die fighting side by side with Athenian. What about side by side with a friend? I... I could do that. Fun note, Athens also executed their Persian envoys, only they threw them down a gorge. Thus, both rivals poetically fulfilled the earth and water tribute. <laughs> Persia is currently the most powerful entity, boasting territory from Greece to Egypt to northern India. The most impressive feature by far is the sophisticated network of administration and bureaucracy to govern such an enormous landmass. Persia is also well known for the toleration of other cultural traditions and religions, which helped to legitimize their rule. The dominant faith is Zoroastrianism likely the first monotheistic faith which influenced Christianity and Judaism yet to come. And it introduced one of the most coolest places of worship, the Fire Temple. While Zoroastrianism was the dominant faith, it was never enforced as the official faith. Although there are some accounts of slavery, it was never an official nor promoted practice. Those professional soldiers and builders are paid wages based on their skill. 
then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Athens and Persia got into a beef during the Ionian Revolt. In aftermath, King Darius vowed to raise Athens to the ground for their interference in the revolt. The Persians vastly outnumbered the Greeks, so this was bound to be an easy win. Sir, the possibility of successfully defeating the Greeks and raising Athens to the ground is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. Only they didn't win. Athens achieved dramatic victory on the plains of Marathon, forcing Persia to retreat into the sea. His ego shattered, Darius promised revenge, but tragically got a case Ooh. of the death. His son Xerxes took the helm to finish the ambition his father could not. Persia invaded Greece for the second time, each player now destined to meet in the narrow pass of Thermopylae. And it's here where I show you the battlefield. This is... <laughs> we made it! We made it to Thermopylae and the view is absolutely stunning! Check it out! Look at those highlands right before us! More over there. I'm so glad we finally made it. Oh my God, this place was so awkward to get to. But now I can finally show you guys a bit of history and the site of the very battlefield where the legendary 300 Spartans and friends had fought. Come on, I'm gonna go take you there now. I've just learned that I have about 45 minutes until my next bus. So I'm gonna have to be pretty quick to show you guys because if I miss this three o'clock bus then the next bus isn't going to come until nine o'clock and that is a bloody long time and I don't want to be waiting here for the next few hours in Thermopylae's as glorious as Thermopylae's is so we're going to speed run a bit of history join me as I'm going to take you to the statue of King Leonidas I am now standing on the very battlefield of Thermopylae. Here I am. Now the cool side is yonder that way. First of all, I want to take you guys to the very monument itself. To start out this Thermopylae adventure. It's the very statue of King Leonidas. And if you don't know who he is, well, he was the king of the Spartans at the time. Back when Sparta was a city-state, what was a very powerful city-state at that, often competing with the city-state of Athens. As you know, the Spartans, they were a warrior culture. I think boys were taken at the age of seven to perform their civic duty to join basically an army conscripted and you were warriors and that was it. All the males were warriors in this society. King Leonidas. But you'll think he looks very different from the movie. Check it out. The pictures that show 300 Spartans fighting against the Persian Empire. The Persians led by Xerxes, Emperor Xerxes. You see the symbols here. There's a lion like a bull, an owl. These are the Spartans. You can tell by their helmets and the shields. I think maybe they're all Spartans actually. You probably won't find much depiction of Persian stuff here. A monument only to Leonidas and his Spartans and friends. Makes sense. King Leonidas looking over the highlands and the very battlefield itself. Let's go check out the battlefield. Made it. Over there is a memorial. You know, I love being a history buff and being the only one here in a very non-touristy site. Tourists don't think to come here, but here I am now anyway, standing right in the middle of the very battlefield of Thermopylae. And look, you can still see some of the fortifications. Look at this. You can still see the old lion here too. Oh, my bags are there.
you probably heard the legends of 300, 300 Spartans up against the mighty Persian Empire. Well, it wasn't just 300 Spartans. There were also 700 Thespians and blokes from Athens and from all other city-states. Now, the reason why that came to be was because the Persian Empire was an existential threat to the Greek city-states. And the Greek city-states, although they had been so busy fighting each other, very preoccupied with their own conflicts, they united in a very momentous occasion against the Persian Empire that was encroaching upon Greece itself. In fact, the Persians had gone up to the extent where they had taken over the north of Greece, up to Macedonia. All that was left, mainly, were the big factions of Athens and Sparta. And this is the very ground where they fought. Hot Gate. The Battle of Hot Gate. I like to think it means like Hell's Gate. Thermopolis. Hell's Gate. That sounds cool. Years and years, centuries ago, the Greeks fought the Persians on this very field where I am standing now. 300 Spartans and friends against the mites of the Persian Empire. I'm going to see if I can get to, to a better high ground. Check it out, you can see the remains of the fortifications here. And oh, what's that over there? Looks like an old building. Let's go check it out. More fortifications made during the time of the big battle itself. You would think all of this would be gone by now. Oh, but no. Here it is, centuries old, still standing today. Very loose. That's fantastic. I'm touching ancient history. I'm stuck in the middle of this dike. But wait, there's more. More fortifications. This is so exciting. <laughs> oh, this I love. Look at it! I'm standing on a very fortified wall! I believe the Phocian Wall. Another friendly state of Sparta. I want to talk to you guys about a bit more history. I think once I get to higher ground. Let's check out this building really quick. I'm not sure if this was at the Battle of Thermopylae. Wow. I can climb the wall. Oh, it's not loose. Still standing. Here's my view. Now that's a good scene of the battle. I'm actually really excited to be here right now. Let's go over this collapsed wall. And you can see what's in here. Ancient building. Ancient battlefield and fortifications. Ancient graffiti. Wow. So a bit of context as how this whole battle kicked off. Dealing with the Persian threat, the Greek city-states decided Thermopylae would be the battleground to hold them off. Hot gate. Thermopylae is a narrow pass between mountains and the sea. Ideal ground to hold a defensive line. And better yet, with a 300 Spartan phalanx. So years ago, during the actual battle, the coastline would extend all the way out to where you see the green fields now. And thus you would have a very narrow choke point 
where the battlefield is. So there isn't any easy escape once you're here. You can kind of see the remnants of the coastline over there. I think it's forming the river. It's interesting how geography and the land changes. Despite numerical advantages, the Persians could not break through Greek defences. The pass was too narrow to go around or outflank. Their cavalry ineffective in this boggy wetlands. The Persians could only chip at the Greeks bit by bit. However, this was costly in resources and manpower. Even the Persian elite soldiers, the immortals, were dropping like flies. The Persians would chip away at the Spartans and friends. It wasn't until a traitor among the Spartan ranks would go up to Xerxes and he would give away a passageway through the highlands that would take the Persians round and then they could flank in a pincer attack the Spartans and the Greeks and friends. So at that very moment, King Leonidas knew that he was beaten and he decided to stay behind with the 300 Spartans and their slaves so that they could cover the Allies' escape. And I think 700 Thespians joined them as well as the friends. And thus they fought on this very battlefield to the bitter end and they died ultimately. The Spartans lost, they lost the battle and the Persians won. Now your exposure to the story of 300 probably comes from the Western media point of view, right? If you've read the novel, then the narrative about 300 was about the Cold War. Or if you've seen the movie, yes, that movie, then the narrative of 300 was about terrorism. But the Hollywood adaptation of 300 is complete bogus. See, Hollywood will have you believe that 300 is a good versus evil story. It's the noble Spartans, a warrior culture, going up against the evil clutches of the Persian Empire. True, there was, there was a clash of different civilizations, but so much time has passed that we're an amalgamation of both. We are the inheritors of both civilizations. The Greek city-states were so disjointed that they believed they had more in common with the Persians than they did with each other. That's how underdeveloped Greek identity was at the time. And it wasn't until years later where Alexander the Great would come and he would conquer all of Greece and he would conquer Persia. And he liked the administrative skills of Persia so much that he basically stole everything about Persia. So if we are the inheritors of Alexander the Great of Macedonia, therefore we are also the inheritors of Persia and their civilization skills. But that's the thing about Hollywood. They want to make you believe that we are only to identify with Western culture. That's not true at all. See, the Persians left Greece after burning down Athens because they had some administrative problems back at home. Yes, there were problems at home which required Xerxes to return to Persia. I'm sorry I neglected to mention the fact that Athens achieved a major naval victory at Salamis. The paranoia that the Greeks would attack his bridge next also motivated Xerxes to return home. So why do we remember Thermopylae, despite the fact that the Greeks lost at the end of the day? The reason why is because of figures like Herodotus, who would write about the occasion years later and rather than just saying the gods did it, he treated history as an investigation, something to be investigated without any particular biases and come to the most utmost ultimate truth you can get. So Herodotus wrote about the battle. He advocated for Greek concept, the concept of a unifying culture, a unifying ideas of values, and thus the Greek identity was born. So while you don't hear much Greeks talk about battles where they did win, for instance, Marathon, Plataea, Mycale. Thermopylae remains famous because it is a part of Greek identity. As you all know now, or at least hopefully, we are the inheritors of a Greek identity as well as a Persian identity. 
But here's another fun fact for you. After the Battle of Thermopylae, the Spartans was actually team up with the Persians and fight against Athens and kick their ass. So I guess the moral of the story is choose your allies wisely and watch out for Spartans. This is Sparta! Spartans! What is your profession? Oh! 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 <laughs> Those people down there think I'm a weirdo. Goodbye, Thermopylae. Goodbye, King Leonidas. Join me in Meteora, where I will um, drop kick a seven year old down a well. And of course, I want to show you guys the lovely little village of Thermopylae, where I am currently trying to find my bus, the last bus to take me back into town. And then I have to sort out the train fiasco. I've done it. I found the little bus stop of Thermopolis. I don't know how much time I have to kill. I know the last bus is in about... I know it's at three o'clock. What's the time now? 2.41, I got about 20 minutes. <laughs> 